Ask any pilot what aircraft has been used to train the most pilots, and they most likely would name the Cessna 150 and 152. But they'd be wrong. The world's most popular trainer, at least so far, is North American's T-6 Texan. Now, those built for the Navy may have been called SNJs, and those built by the Canadians and British may have been named Harvards. But a rose by any other name is still a rose. And as you shall see, this award-winning T-6G is unusually sweet. Now, pre-flighting a T-6 is fairly straightforward, but there are a few unusual features worth noting. Now, take this landing gear warning light, for example. This light indicates to the control tower operator at night that the pilot hasn't forgotten to extend his landing gear. Now, here's a nice feature. Plexiglass covers to prevent the wheels from getting dirty. The T-6 handles like a World War II fighter. It's light on the stick and has an outstanding roll rate, due in part to the ailerons, which, as you can see, have servo tabs, just like those of a Learjet. For a military airplane, the T-6 has a relatively large baggage compartment. The trouble is, when you carry two people, you can only carry 15 pounds of baggage. The fire extinguisher is accessible to the pilot in the rear cockpit. It's also accessible to someone on the ground. It's pretty handy. Something not found on many airplanes is a red passing light. It's used to warn other pilots in formation of your intent to pass. The T-6 has a 40-quart oil tank, and 20 quarts are the minimum required for takeoff. Some pilots like to say that the oil consumption of a T-6 is almost as much as the uh, fuel consumption, but that's obviously an exaggeration, sort of. Another really nice feature are these viewing windows. There's one on each wing, and they allow a pilot to look directly at the landing gear downlocks while in flight. There's never a question about landing gear position. As you can see, the cockpit of a T-6 is strictly military and very functional. Most of the instruments and controls, however, are fairly conventional, but there might be a few goodies in here you're not familiar with. This is a manually operated fuel pump. It's called a wobble pump. In case the engine-driven fuel pump fails, you have to pump and pump and pump and pump, but only for as long as you'd like to keep the engine running. Now here's something that belongs on all airplanes, a low-level warning light for each fuel tank. A light comes on when the quantity in its 70-gallon tank gets down to about 10 or 12 gallons. Some of the most interesting items are actually on the floor, ahead of the pilot's seat. For example, you'll notice right now the controls are locked, but that's no problem because the control lock is situated right here. Now this funny-looking thing down here is not a gas pedal even though it looks like one. That's the starter pedal. When it comes time to start the engine, simply push the pedal and the engine will turn over. Now located to the right and left of the starter pedal are the ventilation controls. With my right foot, I can introduce hot air into the cockpit on a cold day, or I can use my left foot to open the ventilation valve and allow cool air to come in on a hot day. And since the seats on a T6 don't move fore and aft, you have to have a way of accommodating long-legged and short-legged people. And that's done simply by adjusting the rudder pedals. Right now, the pedals are fairly far aft, but I can use my right foot to unlock and push forward the left pedal, and I can use my left foot to unlock and push forward the right pedal. Oh, and I don't want to forget about the rear view mirror. Very important. It's used not only to make sure that you're not being attacked from the rear, but it's used also to check up on your rear seat passenger to make sure that he or she doesn't decide to bail out on you. The rear cockpit is essentially the same as the front cockpit with a few interesting differences. For one thing, although you can extend the landing gear from the rear, you can't raise it. Don't ask. Also, there's no starter pedal in the rear cockpit, which means you have to do the starting from up front. And the third interesting item is this control stick. For example, you can uh, remove it when it's not desired and stow it right here. 
Starting a nine-cylinder radial engine isn't very difficult, and I'd like to show you how. It's just a matter of building up fuel pressure with the wobble pump, giving it a few shots of prime, advancing the throttle once to get some fuel into the carburetor, stepping on the starter pedal, and turning on the mags. And listen to the throaty sound of a 600 horsepower supercharged Pratt & Whitney engine coming to life. Taxiing a Texan isn't much different than taxiing any other tail dragger, but S-turning is a must because there's absolutely no way to see over the nose. But have pity on the instructor in the rear seat. He can't see a thing except the back of his student's head. One nice feature of the Texan is that it is really hard to lose directional control while taxiing. And now this is because holding the control stick aft engages a lock that allows only limited movement of the tailwheel. But if you do need to make tight turns on the ground, all you have to do is push the stick forward. Now this unlocks the tailwheel and allows it to swivel all the way. And this is when a T6 pilot really needs to be on his toes. A high-speed taxiing turn with the stick forward can result in a whirling dervish of a turn, loss of directional control, and possibly a ground loop. This is why the control stick is held aft most of the time while taxiing during the early part of a takeoff roll and as soon as possible after landing. The before takeoff checklist is fairly conventional. There's nothing unusual to do. One nice feature is that you don't have to worry about securing the cabin doors, because there aren't any. But if it's a nice warm day like today, you can take off and fly with the canopies all the way open. One caution though, never leave the canopies open when practicing stalls. It's possible for flames from a backfiring engine to enter the cockpit, and this can make things a bit toasty. The takeoff is also conventional, but only if you're used to powerful tail draggers. Now raise the tail, keep your feet alive on the rudder pedals, wait for the airspeed to reach 80 miles an hour, and then lift off into another era of flight. The best rate of climb airspeed in a T6 at gross weight is 112 miles per hour, which results in a climb rate of about 1,000 feet a minute. There's nothing startling about the performance of a T6. The thrill of flying this machine is more visceral than analytical. There's something mystical, though, about flying an airplane designed to fly like a fighter, an airplane that had to be mastered before a military pilot could solo a real fire-breathing warbird. The roll rate is outstanding. The stick is really light, and the airplane is very responsive, much more than you'd ever expect from a 6,000-pound single. Flying a T6 is the closest that most of us will ever come to flying a Mustang or a Corsair. But you don't have to imagine what it was like to have flown during the war, because when you're in a T6, you're there. You check your six. No one's on your tail. This one's yours, baby. All yours.
Well, I guess it's time to return from our time warp. The war is over. Let's head for base. The T-6 will cruise at 215 miles an hour with the throttle wide open. Trouble is, you'll be burning about 60 gallons an hour in the process. But if you're willing to pull the power back and settle for 185, you can cut the fuel consumption in half to about 32 gallons an hour. Visibility over the nose during an approach is great. No problem at all. But look what happens when you begin to raise the nose during the flare. The runway disappears in a hurry. The Texan can be challenging during a crosswind landing. This is because it has a relatively narrow gear and a high center of gravity. When the tail drops after touchdown, the wing partially blankets out the tail surfaces and the rudder loses much of its effectiveness. One thing I enjoy about a T-6 is making short field takeoffs. Hey, let's do one together. The book calls for using full flaps and like most other aircraft, applying full power before brake release. quite sure just how much runway we did use, but I know it was a heck of a lot less than the 1,100 feet normally required. Now let's run through a wheel landing, but this time, let's see what it's like to make an approach from the rear seat. Now as you can see, or perhaps I should say as you can't see, the view from the rear is horrible. You can't see a thing. You really have to feel sorry for the poor military instructor who had to sit behind a student making his first landing in a T-6. Perhaps that is why warbird pilots say that if you can handle a T-6 from the rear seat, you'll have no trouble soloing a Mustang. Retract the flaps. You know, that's really embarrassing because it signifies that a new T6 pilot is at the controls. Inexperienced pilots often forget to retract the flaps on a T6 because they can't be seen. Out of sight, out of mind, I guess. As you can see, the T6 has split flaps, like on a Cessna 310, but notice that they span across the bottom of the fuselage as well. Once the engine is shut down, the only way to raise the flaps is to remove the engine cowling and use a hand-operated hydraulic pump behind the engine. Hey, Grant, how'd you like to do me a favor? Yeah, 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 I know what you want. It's nice to have some help around. Everyone knows that buying a Warbird can be an expensive proposition. A P-51, for example, can cost the better part of a million dollars. But T-6s don't fit into that category. A really nice one doesn't cost any more than what Cessna used to charge for a moderately equipped 172. But a T-6 is not an airplane for everyone. Now, right now, I'd like you to meet Bill Melamed, the proud owner of this rebuilt Texan. Forgot to raise the flaps again, didn't you, Bear? Bill, this is not the time or the place. Oh, sorry about that, Captain. Everyone knows you're awfully proud of this airplane, Bill. But tell me, what made you decide to buy a T-6? Well, I guess it goes back to when I was a kid, Barry, during World War II. I used to love to draw military aircraft in combat. I'd even daydream about flying them someday. And I think the airplane that I drew the most often was the T-6. I guess this was because, to me, the T-6 looked most like what I thought an airplane should look like. I was really in love with that machine. Call it nostalgia call it a love affair with the past, call it anything you want. Maybe I'm just a romantic. But owning and flying this piece of aviation history has made me one very happy pilot. She's all yours, Barry. Well, Bill, I gotta tell you, this is about the most beautiful T-6 I've ever seen. Thanks a lot. 
This hand-operated hydraulic pump can be used to pressurize the hydraulic system on the ground with the engine shut down. It also can be used to raise the flaps. Now you know why I didn't retract the flaps after landing. It gave me a good excuse to show you something really nifty. Now as you look into this area here, behind the engine, you can see that there's quite a bit of plumbing, but it's all not as confusing as it first appears. That's because the various fluid lines on this airplane have been color-coded for easy identification. The yellow lines represent the oil system, and the red lines make up the fuel system. The blue lines carry hydraulic fluid. In all of its versions, 20,000 T6s were built between 1938 and 1953, and about 400 of them are still flying in the United States. Now, no one knows how many hundreds or perhaps thousands are still flying in other countries. One thing is for certain, though. The North American T6 Texan is the most significant training aircraft ever produced. And those who have been privileged to fly one can testify to the claim that there isn't anyone who doesn't love.